Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of September 13th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. Also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, where are we headed on the PFD as the session comes to an end? Second, the additional arguments the governor should be using to push back on PFD cuts. Third, we explain how both the legislature and the administration are relying on distorted revenue forecasts. And now, let's join Michael. Well, Brad, let's dive into this. Uh, first things first, you know, the, the special session ends tonight at midnight, and, uh, and, and here we are. Uh, with nothing. I mean, literally 90 days, we haven't had a single bill that has made it out. We haven't talked about the PFD. We haven't fixed the PFD. We haven't really even talked about a long-term fiscal plan. And we haven't even fixed the the COVID things that they wanted to fix, the telehealth and the and the licensure stuff. So here we are. What give us give us the 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 breakdown here with number one the uh, PFD still unsettled as the special session nears its end. Well, I was hopeful to talk this morning about, you know, what the where the legislature was going to land by the end of today on the PFD um, and talk about the details of a new Senate plan, and I'll still talk about that somewhat. But the long and the short of it is we're headed to the fourth special session to find out anything about the PFD. The only thing that there's even room for left uh, in the in the session before midnight tonight is for the Senate to simply ratify, uh, approve uh, what the House has done uh, on the uh, on the PFD and 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 on the budget bill generally uh, and confirm that. I suppose there would be enough hours in the day. If it was all preset for the Senate to vote on for the for finance to report out the budget bill for the Senate floor to vote on it uh, if they made amendments to send it back over the house for the house to decline uh, and for it to go to conference and to have a conference report out and for both bodies to vote on it by the end of the day but I but I very much doubt uh, that uh, that would require a waiver of a bunch of rules and I very much doubt uh, that's where we get to the most likely outcome now uh, is is that it just dies we die at the end of the 30 days uh, and the governor e- either immediately sends them to the next special session. I've lost track. What, it, what would it be? The fourth? fourth. The fourth one. Yeah, fourth special session. Uh, uh, sends them to the next special session, or uh, or you know takes a takes a break and uh, and and then sends them uh, to a special session. Um, in the end, the thing I thought I would be talking more about today is a proposal that got rolled out by Senate Finance over the weekend. Uh, as a as a Senate finance proposal for uh, the PFD, both now and as a uh, long term fix, uh, that was uh, interesting. It ties essentially ties the PFD to uh, uh, to new revenues. Uh, it would uh, set uh, it would build toward a fifty fifty split between revenues if. The state revenue commissioner and the legislative finance division director, in other words, the the administration's uh, uh, chief uh, uh, revenue officer and the legislature's 
uh, chief revenue analyst, agreed that measures uh, by uh, December 15th, 2024, agreed that measures would uh, had been enacted, which would generate 700 million in new annually recurring revenues. Um, and it would build the PFD uh, from uh, uh, the 1100 up to 1300 uh, over a couple of years and then grow it after that uh, with inflation subject to going to 50-50 to on December 15th, 2024, if uh, if the revenue measures had been enacted. It's essentially it's essentially a bill that, that reflects Senator Hoffman's stair-step approach right. uh, of, of dealing with the uh, uh, with the fiscal situation and the fact that it was coming out of Senate finance over the weekend, uh, that, that it reflected Senator Hoffman's approach that Senate finance is so closely split that Senator Hoffman is sort of the deciding vote. I, I thought that might be where the Senate finance committee was going to head, but they didn't, they didn't act on it yesterday. Right. Um, uh, and so uh, it's, it's, uh, like like a lot of other proposals, it's just just sort of sitting there on the table as we glide into the uh, into the session. Well, and and I got to say, at this point, I'm a little surprised because uh, you know, for our conversations last week with uh, uh, with Mike Shower, I had a couple of conversations with some staffers and a senator or two behind the scene, and I was just asking, you know, what's going to happen next and. The ex- expectation was, of course, that, you know, they would take this up and they would fight it out and they would, you know, do this stuff and maybe they'd just get it out on the floor for a vote. But I don't and I don't know where to lay this. I can't get Senator Machicki to get back to me. And so but at some point I'm starting asking the question, I mean, are you I mean, are, are is this a leadership struggle? Is there something else going on in there? I mean, do we have the faction still fighting? Obviously, Bert Stedman thinks everything that doesn't agree with him is BS, Bert Stedman. But I mean, you know, it's it is is this just a failure of leadership to get these things moved and on the floor? They've got a bill in front of them. They previously had a vote of twelve to eight for a twenty two hundred and thirty dollar dividend. Why, I mean, why can't we? Why can't we get this thing moving in that direction? Well, I don't think uh, – Stedman's not going to let it out of the committee. Uh, Stedman and Click are not going to let a bill out of the committee that they don't think they can hold on the floor. Um, and so they are th- – this bill I thought uh, was going to move because I thought they thought that they had the votes on the floor. But but they must be uncertain about whether they've got uh, the votes to pass this on the floor. Um, and, and And that would relate to – there's an uncertainty about whether there's going to be an amendment uh, to to take it to twenty three hundred dollars, to take it to POMV fifty fifty now, and make an uh, make an excess draw to uh, uh, to uh, to fund government uh, to accommodate a twenty three hundred dollar uh, PFD. They must think that there that there's a chance that if they get this to the floor, that amendment prevails. Um, in, in it, it is it is Bert's. It's not. I don't think it's leadership. I think it's just Bert and Click's judgment about uh, about you know letting something out of the committee. They just don't want to let it out of the committee if they don't have uh, control over it uh, on the floor. So it's. Um, I mean, you can you can try to roll the committee, but that would be. Um, I'm not sure there'd be the floor votes for that. So it's. Uh, it, I think they're just going to let it glide into the end of this special session. Uh, let the clock run out. You know, tomorrow I, we may be proved wrong. I may be proved wrong on that, but but it looks right now like they're going to let it run into the glide into the end of the special session. Let the clock run out and um, and try it again uh, in the in the in the next special session. Right now, though, I mean to to be clear, I think most people listening to this program understand it. But to be clear, there is no PFD. Uh, the governor uh, vetoed uh, the the legislature passed. Uh, a PFD that was contingent on drawing the CBR. There was a vote against the CBR, and so the PFD was half the size that the, that the legislature uh, voted out last time. The governor vetoed that, I think, for good reason. Um, and and right now, the, the the PFD on the floor is the $1,100 that the House passed, but that's half funded by the SBR. Uh, and the governor says there's no money in the SBR because because it, get, it didn't get reverse sweeped. It's got caught in the sweep and it's back in the general fund. So um, there, there is no PFD right now and there won't be a PFD if uh, we glide into the end of the special session. We're going to have to go to another one to uh, to establish a PFD. 
Uh, Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. So the governor has said on the program here that he's already investigating venues for a, for another special session, this time on the road system. Uh, do you have any predictions if he calls it, when he calls it, and what happens uh, when it gets to that point? I don't have any separate predictions. The one I saw in the uh, in the uh, in, in the Twitter feeds of the of those who are commenting and, and elsewhere in the newspapers is that uh, the governor calls it immediately and keeps it in Juneau. Um, that would be a little surprising given what he said before. Uh, but you know, if if they're close, if he thinks they're close, that might not be a bad strategy. But if they're if they're not close, uh, I, it really, I mean, they, they just if they need time then you've got plenty of time to set it back up on the road system. You've also got the issue of uh, Senator Reinbold, who is now, you know, <laughs> can't can't easily get from one place to another. Um, uh, so if you need her vote, you want to set it up someplace where she can vote, right? Uh, where she can show up. So that's a that's an issue as well. Let's move on to number two of our weekly top three, and that is this editorial by Larry Persilli in the uh, Juno Empire. Um, and he, I, I got to tell you, I got so many things, I got so much heartache with this uh, opinion piece. Uh, the one thing that caught, that just leaped out at me as I was reading this, uh, as I was reading this piece, was uh, him talking about uh, how it, he kind of uh, uh, likens the whole thing to a jigsaw puzzle. And he says the puzzle would go to better go together better with the governor who doesn't stretch the numbers to suit his argument and who thinks more about public services that can build the state's future and less about dividends that can build his reelection campaign, which for me immediately Persilly shows where his priorities are. It's all about public services. It's all about you want to build the state's future. It's public services that do it, not private enterprise, not not entrepreneurship, not, you know, people putting their money in their heart. It's government services that build a state and that that immediately soured me on the whole rest of the piece but give us uh, we got about two minutes here for you to get started on this <laughs> I, th I think you just summed it up uh, uh really well there's a lot in this in this editorial it's in that for if people want to read it and haven't read it it's in the juno uh, empire probably will show up elsewhere in the state uh over the course of the next week um it, there's a lot in this in this editorial that i think uh uh, one could one could rage on uh, about uh, appropriately, but there's one thing. As I was reading this, there's one thing that we've talked about previously in the show, and I think the governor is missing a step uh, by not making uh, this argument. And that it it is the the distributional argument that the reason for the PFD is because it is the. Uh, uh, the best use of funds for middle and lower income Alaska families. Put differently, PFD cuts, using PFD cuts to fund government has the largest adverse impact on middle and lower income Alaska families. And when we say middle, we mean upper middle as well. It's 80% of Alaska families right. are, are worse off using PFD cuts to fund government uh, than other options. I think as since I've made it before, I think that's a great pushback on all of these who say, you know, you're, you're, you just want a big PFD to fund your your reelection campaign or you want a PFD because, you know, you that's what your that's what your base uh, expects. Um, the government, the governor really has never and, and Brian got caught. Brian Fetcher got caught in this trap. Uh, with uh, with Stedman and with others during the hearing that you were that you were referencing. I mean, one of the questions to Brian was, how do you justify a 50-50 PFD compared to a 25-75 PFD, which is something that's uh, that's also been floated. And Brian said, well, we just think 50 percent feels right. We think 50-50 feels right. I mean, that's actually what he said. And 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 the better answer to that to me, the better answer to that is because it's better for middle and lower income Alaska families to put that money in their pockets and to find another way to fund government uh, uh, 
any other tax approach, sales taxes, income taxes, any other tax approach uh, would take less money out of Alaskans' pockets, 80% of Alaskans' pockets than, than, than PFD cuts. It's better for the Alaska economy, and that's why, Senator, because it's better for 80% of Alaska families, and it's better for the overall uh, Alaska economy. And I, to me, that's a very strong answer. It's a strong answer that the administration has never made uh, because they're sort of concerned about where it goes with, with respect to alternative revenues. But to me, it's a very strong answer. And it's the same answer that, that, that the administration ought to give to uh, personally or anybody else who, who writes these op-eds, anybody in the legislature. Look, we support a PFD because it's better for 80% of Alaska families and better for the overall economy. Right. The, it's... Only, one, the only ones who are doing better uh, with PFD cuts is the top 20%. And they don't need it as much. Right. So I, I, they just they need to start pushing back, I think, with that argument. Right, because of all the levers that you could pull, this is the one that's most detrimental to the Alaska economy, period. That should be it, full stop. Let's continue on with this piece uh, from Larry Persilli in the Juno Empire. Uh, again, at the very top of the piece, Larry obviously, you know, puts his puts his stripes out there and you can see exactly what he's pulling for, which, of course, is that public services are what build a state, not the people, not the economy, not the entrepreneurship, not the you know private enterprise. None of that stuff. It's always government that pushes all this stuff, which seems to be the again, the feeling from many people uh, in the in the legislature, including people like Bert Stedman and Click Bishop and Natasha von Imhoff, who supposedly are smaller government conservatives because they wear the elephant on their lapel. But this is all part of the problem. Persilli goes on to talk about, you know, this inordinately large PFD and how we can't afford to overdraw and that the the funds in the in the ERA are actually smaller than what they said. He's over stating it and we can't possibly overdraw that because we may need that next year again this goes back to the whole house is on fire and the fire extinguisher analogy brad uh your thoughts on the rest of this persilly article well it's uh here's the thing that that really you know i i chuckle at sometimes and i just you know tear up at other times the the top 20 percent want big government they want the big spending programs they want the big capital budgets that that you know support the construction companies they labor uh wants their uh their higher income uh, uh the 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 government employees union wants their higher income government employees to continue to be employed and they want to continue to have the big programs for them but they don't want to pay for it they, they, the, the top 20% are the, are the, are the cheerleaders on no taxes, no taxes for, for government. Um, keep these programs. We can't, we can't afford to lose these programs. In fact, we need more programs. We need a higher capital budget. We need more spending for the schools. We need more spending for, uh, for more transfers to, uh, to local government to support their capital budgets. But they don't want to pay for it. And so what they do is they scream and shout about all of this, all of this need for the spending, and that's how you build a state, and that's how you build infrastructure. But then they turn around, and they say, and we need to do it through PFD cuts. And why do they do it? Why do they say that? Say it that way? Because the impact of PFD cuts on the top 20% is trivial. It takes a takes a for the top 1%, it takes 0.2% um, of their income. But, but and it pushes all, and then it pushes all of the burden to middle and lower income Alaska families. By the time you get to the to the uh, uh, to the lowest twenty uh, percent, uh, it's taking something like seventeen uh, percent of the of their income out of their pocket. So it's just it it, it is one giant exercise in hypocrisy. Every time I see Larry or somebody else from the twenty. Top 20% say we need all these government programs. We've got to keep all these government programs, but we don't want to pay for it. So we need to use PFD cuts. Right. And that's why I, that's why I say I think it's time for the administration to pu- push back and say, look, guys, you're, you're, you continue talking about all these spending programs you want, but you're doing it with the, with the, with the mechanism that t- has the largest adverse impact to 80% of Alaska families and has the largest adverse impact to the overall Alaska economy. You want to spend this stuff, come up with a, with a revenue mechanism that taxes you 
the top 20%, as well as everybody else and taxes everybody fairly, like a flat, flat tax, as opposed to using a mechanism that pushes it all to middle and lower income Alaska families. Dave Conklin says, if the PFD is because of mineral rights, then why does everyone get it? If you're not a property owner, then what mineral rights are you being denied? Alaska is a great state to get on the government teat and just make babies. Uh, David, that's because in the state of Alaska, we are unique. All mineral rights are owned in common uh, per the Alaska state constitution. The state owns all the subsurface mineral rights unless it's on federally patented land. But uh, they own all the mineral rights in common. And so we are all owners of the resource. And that's why uh, Hammond and others pushed for this dividend to see that Alaskans got a small portion of those royalties and those riches directly in their hands because Hammond and company could see exactly what was happening with the spending. And we're still seeing it today. We're still seeing it today, Brad. I mean, that's that's the whole reason behind the taking of the PFD and all that other stuff, right? Yeah, exactly right. It's, I mean, what Hammond was doing with with uh, with with the uh, PFD and with and with uh, uh, giving a portion of it or or, or generating or, or directing a portion of the royalty revenues, um, uh, the investments off of royalty revenues to uh, to individuals. He was trying to repl- replicate what goes on in the lower 48. In the lower 48, we have private ownership of minerals. Uh, private uh, landowners receive. Uh, uh, their royalties from the minerals. They spend it in the local economy. They make investments in the local economy. It generates additional economic activity in the local economy. Um, and and you can see the benefits of it in Oklahoma and Texas, Louisiana, New Mexico, uh, the lower 48 states that have private ownership. We don't. Uh, in Alaska, we don't because of the Statehood Act. And we look a lot more, if you don't do something like that, we look a lot more like Angola, or Azerbaijan, where the government controls all of the revenue and you have a select few, um, it'd it'd be 21 plus 11 plus the governor in Alaska, you have a select few just deciding where all of that royalty revenue goes. So what Hammond said is, let's let's split it so that the Alaska economy looks more like the lower 48, the successful lower 48. Uh, states with with a portion of the revenues going into the private economy and and being invested or spent or 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 used in in private hands uh, as opposed to let's make Alaska look more like the lower 48 states as opposed to Angola or Azerbaijan or so or the Soviet Union or or any other country where those revenues uh, go and are controlled uh, solely by the state it's a, it's a brilliant it's a brilliant workaround uh, of the of the of the issues created by the statehood act putting all of that money all of those revenues uh in the state's hands i i, I cannot credit hammond enough for the for the brilliance of of being able to create something that made the alaska economy uh, uh more similar to uh to the lower the successful lower 48 economies than it otherwise would have right. uh, but those those who want to convert the pfd take the entire pfd and convert it to government want to make alaska look more like angola azerbaijan and and the soviet union where a select few uh in the government decide where all that money goes and we've seen where i mean you see with venezuela you can see it with angola and azerbaijan you can see it with the soviet union you can see the consequences of 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 a government program that puts all that money in uh, in government hands, and so uh, Hammond was trying to Hammond was trying to replicate successful lower forty eight capitalist systems as opposed to unsuccessful uh, socialist systems. Right. Well, and he even made the comment that you know the state ownership of the mineral rights is socialism, as Rob Myers points out in the chat room, and the PFD is the way that we converted back to capitalism. I mean, that was the way to try and in- inject a capitalistic aspect into this quasi-socialist uh, way that the statehood compact, I mean, which was fo- forced, by the way, that was all forced on us by the federal government at statehood. It wasn't a choice that we made. You and I didn't make it. Uh, you know, we didn't, we don't like it, but we have to live within it. The way to convert it back to capitalism is through the PFD. That's, that's the way, how we get our capitalistic take on this. Exactly right, and and for and so whenever somebody says, uh, "Oh, it's socialism to give that money out," it's not socialism. It is a replication of the lower forty-eight. It is a replication of the sharing of 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 oil and gas hydrocarbon revenues into the private sector. 
uh, as opposed to letting it, you know, slip into the control of just a, a just a select few in government. So it's it, it is the epitome of capitalism in the sense that we're getting that money into private hands as opposed to letting it go to government and letting uh, letting 21 plus 11 plus the governor make the decision about how it's spent. Right, exactly. We were just talking about the the, the permanent fund and the ownership of the of the minerals in common and how the PFD is actually the ultimate expression of capitalism because it tries to take, you know, what is this quasi-socialistic constitutional a mandate that we have in the state of Alaska, which was forced on us by the federal government, that we all collectively own the resources, and it attempts to put a capitalistic spin on that to emulate other states like Texas and North Dakota, where the owners get paid a royalty, and that helps stimulate the economy. That was Hammond's initial intent, was to take all that money out of the hands of the government, so it wasn't like an Angola or a Soviet Union where the government owned everything, and put some of that money back in the hands of the people. That's what it was all about. Yeah, exactly right. We, we, Hammond's vision was to emulate the successful uh, uh, economies of Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, the other oil-producing states, by by distributing a portion of the riches from their oil and gas resources to uh, individual owners. Uh, in in the lower 48 states, it occurs automatically because the royal the land is owned uh, in, individually, privately, and and the money flows. To those individuals and you can see the impact there's been study on study on economic study about the positive impacts of putting that hands in private ownership uh, in the lower 48 states compared to something like venezuela or angola where it all goes to government hammond's vision was to was to develop something that emulated the lower 48 states by getting a portion of the money uh, in private hands in the same way that it happens uh, in those states and to get it out of government's hands uh, all of all in government hands, where a select few were making the de- make the decision about where that money goes. It was a it's a brilliant, brilliant solution right. uh, to a very difficult problem and very pro capitalist. Um, let's take a look at the final thing. Uh, Persilli talks about how numbers are being stretched, and we see this all the time. People working off different sets of numbers. You know, there's you know numbers, da- liars, damn liars, and statistics, or whatever you want to say. Uh, the administration and the legislature, you say, are working off different revenue forecasts, but they're both messed up. And so, give us your thoughts on this for number three. Yeah, this is a plague on both your houses type thing. So, so Stedman and is is directing legislative finance to use the, the, the continue to use the oil revenue numbers that were in the spring, the administration's spring revenue forecast. At the time the spring revenue forecast was done, oil prices were still low, uh, uh, relatively speaking, and the, and, the, and the administration's spring revenue forecast uh, predicts, projects $61, projects $61 for FY22, $62 for FY23, and, and so on and so forth in terms of small increments. Well, what's happened since is near-term oil prices have spiked. Instead of $61, it's $71 for FY22. That's what the market tells us right now. For FY23, instead of $62, it's 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 $71 uh, is what the market's telling us right now. The administration updated the, the spring forecast in August, came up with a whole new set of numbers uh, near 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 term numbers that are much more reflective of the market, but the Senate has and and legislate has directed legislative finance to just ignore them, and the, and the reason you ignore them is because you want the near term prices to look much lower, which makes the deficit look much higher, which which enables them to you know rant and rave about about you know we we've got to have the 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 PFD money. For the government, because we've got all these all these huge deficits, they're playing a game with numbers. The legislature is playing a game with numbers that isn't supported by market numbers. They've picked up these artificial numbers from from what's turned out to be artificial numbers from the spring revenue forecast and won't update them for the August forecast. So they're 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 playing games to to make the near term look uh, worse than it really is. Longer term, the administration has projected prices and production volumes that are well in excess of what the market's telling us uh, is going on. By 2029, the administration's price forecast, even in the August numbers, is 21%, 20% above what the market price is telling us, uh, what the market's telling us the price is going to be in that. And the administration redid all of the production numbers in the, in the, 
in the spring forecast without a good basis for doing it. And now they tell us by 2029, the volumes are going to be 17 percent higher than than what they did in the fall forecast. And the reason the administration's doing that is because they don't want to admit that these deficits continue. They're trying to create a storyline where the deficits end. So both sides are playing are playing numbers games that are very, very frustrating. Never let a crisis go to waste, my friend. I think that's the uh, the thing here, especially with the low numbers uh, from the uh, legislative side. Uh, that's exactly it. We need that PFD because look at all the deficits that we've created with these mathematical. Oh, never mind. I mean, that's really what it comes down to, right, Brad? I mean, this is a crisis. If, we, if the numbers are lower and we're utilizing numbers and we're ignoring any kind of new revenue or even what the market is saying, we could continue to justify everything we're doing uh, under the guise of look at these massive critical deficits that we've got uh, because we're in crisis mode. We need to have that PFD. That's the justification. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the prices, the prices the legislature is using for FY22 and FY23 are 15 percent below what what the market is telling us right now, what EIA is telling us right now. There's been a change. What happened was OPEC tightened up on production, started to control the market again, uh, artificially constrained supply as they can do. Uh, and and prices prices went up. Uh, there's been a change since the spring forecast, um, but the but the Senate and legislative finance, even though the administration gave them updated numbers, this is the thing that's just outrageous. Even though the administration gave them updated numbers in August, legislative finance, Senate the Senate and legislative finance uh, continue to use the 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 pre OPEC numbers, the the spring revenue numbers. Uh, or the spring price numbers to uh, to calculate the revenues. And it's just, I mean, they're they're playing games. They're absolutely playing games. The um, the 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 uh, working group came up with uh, a set of agreed base of base assumptions. Hell, the Senate Senate Finance isn't even paying attention to those. It's 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 tying back. It's like it's like Bert said. What's the lowest possible price we could have? Um, and uh, you know, just pick, go find some time when the price was low. And we'll use that and, and inflate the deficit. And the spring revenue forecast is is uh, is what they're doing in response to that. I, that that's bad. What the but but let's be fair. What the administration do is doing in the out years is also bad. Right. Because they're inflating the price to 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 paint the story that oh we just need this bridge financing, this bridge draw, and everything will be fine. We don't need taxes. We don't need revenues. Uh, we're all we're all going to be fine and dandy once we get you know over this bridge well the market is telling us that's not true either um and and the market is telling us we need some we need revenues if we're going to continue spending at the level in the governor's own budget we need revenues and and for the administration to just you know uh say that's not true is just you know it's so there's a credibility issue The, the administration is shooting itself in the foot by creating a credibility issue on the on the numbers it's using absolutely well and again Numbers, damn, you know, numbers, damn numbers, and and statistics. I mean, that's where we're at right now with this uh, this whole thing. Depending on whose numbers you choose, and and this is this is the this is the battle. I mean, we saw this again between Fetcher and uh, and Stedman uh, during this last debate. He wasn't getting the answers he wanted. He kept you know badgering the thing and you know saying, uh, you know, well, how much damage is it going to do? Yada yada yada. I mean, this is a, this is all this the whole thing becomes more of a philosophical debate than really a debate about real actual numbers. It it, it is Michael, and that's frustrating. I mean, we de- we got people hanging by a thread out there. The PFD is important to middle and lower income Alaska families. We got an Alaska economy that's hanging by a thread. Getting the PFD, the PFD in the hands of people d- does more for the Alaska economy than than any other revenue approach, any other fiscal approach we can take. Uh, and and yet we're we got people playing with numbers uh, to find out you know these these pseudo battles instead of just paying attention to the goddamn numbers and making a decision based on hard numbers and uh, and the and the impact those numbers have. Right, exactly. I couldn't couldn't agree more. And yet here we are. 18 hours away from the end of the special session, we can't figure out anything because, you know, politics, baby. It just makes me want to smash my head against the wall. Um, All right. Well, Brad, um, continue to enjoy your time back home. And uh, we look forward to uh, look forward to seeing you get back to the uh, to, to God's country up here when you get back. 
Yeah, I'm uh, I'm coming back over the weekend. I'll uh, I'll be doing uh, my regular program from from my regular seat in Alaska uh, next Tuesday. Okay, well, it's good to hear from you, my friend. Stay safe, travel well, and we will see you when you get back. Great, thanks, Michael. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Well. That's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top